We've had two big Apple events in the past month and change, May's Let Loose event and June's WWDC. WWDC offered an interesting view of Apple's integrated ecosystem of OSs and a shift in focus to AI, or Apple intelligence, supported workflows, and the Let Loose event gave us the first taste of the hardware that will support it. I'm Scott with B&H, and today I want to talk about this year's new iPads and all of the cool things announced with them. Apple's Let Loose event showed us three new devices, the M4 iPad Pro, the M2 iPad Air, an Apple Pencil Pro, some major updates for the Pro apps, namely Final Cut Pro for iPad 2 and Logic Pro for iPad 2, one new Pro app, Final Cut Camera, and some new innovations that will almost certainly make their way into other Apple products, the tandem OLED display and the new M4 chip. Let's start with the iPad Air, now with an 11-inch and 13-inch configuration. There's nothing particularly groundbreaking here, but it's still a nice option, especially if you don't need the power of the Pro model, or if you want colors that are more vibrant than silver or space black. Apple, please. I promise that Pros can handle colors that aren't grayscale. The main spec upgrade from the previous Air is the M1 chip has been replaced with the M2, which was expected, but also appreciated. This is especially true as Apple is integrating more AI features into their apps and OSs, as they demonstrated at WWDC. There's some more external changes as well. While the specs on the camera haven't changed from the previous generation's cameras, the front camera is now landscape-oriented. This was a change made to the base iPad last generation and has now made its way to both the Air and Pro models. It's a design change that makes the iPad less of a big phone and more of a two-in-one. The shift is also reflected in the new Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro, which features a function key row like you'd see in a laptop or desktop. But in case you're worried that these new iPads are becoming too laptop-like, there's another reason to upgrade to one of the new iPad models, the Apple Pencil Pro. It is only compatible with the M2 iPad Air and the M4 iPad Pro, and it is a noticeable upgrade to the drawing device. There are a lot of new ways to interact with it, like the squeeze function that pulls up a tool palette, a nifty hover function that helps show exactly where you're about to touch down, as well as which tool you're using, better haptic feedback to make the experience more intuitive and cohesive, and also a gyroscope that allows for more precise control, which Apple has dubbed the barrel roll. Of course, the real headliner of the Let Loose event was the iPad Pro, which debuted both Apple's new tandem OLED display and their fourth generation of Apple Silicon. But before we cover those features more in depth, let's take a closer look at everything else that comes in this package. Like the iPad Air, there are two models, an 11-inch and a 13-inch. The webcam is now landscape-oriented, and there is support for the new Apple Pencil Pro. But by opting for the Pro line, you get a ton of extra features. Both the Pro and Air have 12 megapixel ultra wide angle front facing cameras, but the iPad Pros have the true depth camera system and facial recognition. Both the Air and the Pro have rear facing 12 megapixel cameras capable of filming in 4K resolutions, but the Pro can record in the ProRes codec, has a LiDAR scanner for 3D work and AR experiences, and has adaptive true tone flash for better document scanning. Of course, even great video quality feels cheap if it isn't accompanied by quality audio. While the iPad Air has two speakers and two microphones, the Pro has four speakers and four studio quality microphones, and while both the Pro and the Air have USB-C ports, the port on the Pro includes Thunderbolt support. One oddity with this generation of iPads is the fact that the iPad Pro is now thinner and lighter than the iPad Air. The tandem OLED display doesn't need a backlight, making it thinner than the IPS displays that the iPads traditionally have. Additionally, Apple is pulling some nifty tricks with heat management that enable the Pro to be thinner than before. They've added graphite sheets to the main housing that better dissipate the heat, and they have turned the Apple logo itself into a heatsink by adding copper elements. It also helps that the M4 is Apple's most resource-efficient chip yet, making it easier to keep cool. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the tandem OLED display is a bigger selling point than the slim profile it facilitates. The OLED screens are amazing for rich colors and contrasty deep blacks. There's no backlight washing out the colors and details, but there's also no backlight to make the screen bright enough to see clearly in well-lit environments. So, what the engineers did is layer two OLED panels on top of each other. This allows for OLED fidelity with LCD levels of brightness. But that isn't the only new feature for the iPad Pro's display. The glass itself is open for customization on the iPad Pros, or at least the ones that have a terabyte or more of internal storage. 
There's the standard glossy display with anti-reflective coating, but there's also the nano texture display glass. While Apple didn't use the word matte during the event, this is an impressively innovative matte screen. Instead of coating like a traditional matte display, nano textured glass works by making microscopic etchings on the glass to diffract incoming ambient light while allowing the display panels to shine through unhindered. Theoretically, at least. The model that wound up on my desk isn't nano textured, but reading reviews, it sounds like there is a slight loss of vibrance. And while this is not the first Apple product to feature a nano texture display, it is the first one with a touchscreen, which means that it will be put under more rigorous stress testing than the studio monitors or iMac screens. If you are using it in mostly environments with a lot of ambient light, like say, on a set or in an event, this could be a fantastic feature, but is also not inherently better for all use cases. But the nano texture screen isn't the only reason you might want to spring for a one terabyte or two terabyte configuration. While all of the new iPad Pros have M4 chips, the ones with a terabyte or more of internal storage have an extra performance core bringing the total to four performance cores and 10 cores overall. The RAM also doubles from eight gigabytes to 16 gigabytes. Now, let's talk about that M4 chip. This was a little bit of a surprise for a few reasons. Reason number one, usually Apple debuts new silicon generations on more traditional computers, usually MacBooks and a desktop option like the Mac Mini or iMac. Reason number two, the M3 came out only seven months before the M4 and was only used in MacBooks and the iMac. The M3 never made it to the Mac Mini, Mac Studio, Mac Pro, or any of the iPads. And in the Let Loose event, the M4 is compared mostly with the M2, which, to be fair, was the last chip that was featured in an iPad. It's hard to directly compare it to the M3 since MacBooks and iPads are so different. They run different operating systems, do different processes, and have very different heat management capabilities. That said, Geekbench tests comparing the M3 MacBook Air and the M4 iPad Pro make it look like the M4 outperforms its predecessor. Most of the features touted during the event are carryovers from the M3. Ray tracing, mesh shading, dynamic caching, etc. There are some new things too, like an increase in performance and efficiency cores, more transistors, an improved 120 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth, and of course, a display engine that supports the tandem OLED display. The biggest difference between the M3 and M4 is the jump from first generation to second generation three nanometer nodes. These second generation nodes perform more efficiently and are cheaper to manufacture, which explains the short cycle for the M3 generation. So if the fast turnaround between silicon generations made you wonder whether or not an M3 MacBook or iMac is still a good investment, they are. There's no need to wait for the M4 MacBooks if you need a new laptop now. Without getting too in the weeds with supply chains and development cycles, the M4 chip takes the features and improvements from the M3 and just runs them on better hardware that happens to be easier to produce en masse. While the M4 has performance improvements across the board, special attention was paid to the capabilities of the Neural Engine during the Let Loose event. WWDC followed up on this by revealing how AI, or Apple Intelligence, is being deeply integrated across every line of Apple products. While the WWDC was jam-packed with impressive implementations of AI, it was mostly focused on more universal consumer use cases, which is understandable considering the magnitude of announcements that they made, but I had been hoping for an expanded details on the Pro apps that were announced during the Let Loose event, or maybe even releases for the apps that are slated for spring 2024. Unfortunately, that didn't pan out, but it is still worth diving into what we do know. Hi folks, funny story. While I was editing this video, Apple did release Final Cut Pro for iPad 2 and Final Cut Camera. I haven't used them yet, but I really would like to cover them in a future video. In the meantime, please keep that in mind while Past Me talks about apps that he didn't know would be released so soon after the script was approved. Thank you. The Let Loose event included announcements for Logic Pro for iPad 2, Final Cut Pro for iPad 2, and the brand new Final Cut Camera app. Of those three, only Logic Pro for iPad 2 has been released. Yes, I will be saying the full clunky names for the Pro apps every single time. Logic Pro for iPad 2 has some new Apple intelligence enhanced features, like the Sessions Players, which lets you add in generated drums, bass, or piano parts into a track, Chroma Glow, which uses machine learning to make digital tracks sound more like warm analog recordings, and a nifty stem splitting feature that takes a music piece 
and separates the instruments and or vocals into individual tracks. Final Cut Pro for iPad 2 isn't released yet, and the only AI feature teased for it so far is increased performance for subject detection and rotoscoping, but there was a big announcement that potentially indicates the direction that they want to take the platform in. The yet-to-be-released free Final Cut camera app gives a professional level of control to iPhone and iPad cameras. More importantly, up to four devices running Final Cut camera can be synced to an iPad running Final Cut Pro for iPad 2 where the clips are automatically transferred, synced, and turned into a live multicam feed that the Final Cut Pro for iPad 2 user can edit on the fly within the app. That main user can also take control of the camera settings of the individual Final Cut camera streams in real time. I think that this could be potentially very useful for quick on-the-go shoots, especially for live events where you either don't have much time to set up or maybe need to be as discreet as possible. I actually held off making this video until after WWDC to see if they would release these apps or at the very least give us more info. It's a workflow that I'd really like to try, but unfortunately wasn't able to for this video. Another feature announced for Final Cut Pro for iPad 2 is the ability to work off of an external drive. That should add a nice amount of flexibility, both in terms of media management and storage, as well as project sharing. While Final Cut Pro for iPad 2 isn't released yet, I think it is a potential indication for the market that Apple's courting with the iPad Pro. It's not a laptop replacement like so many people seem to want it to be. It's powerful, but doesn't have the ports or heat management to compete with a MacBook as a traditional workhorse. But it is perfect for artists who need a pin-based workflow on a powerful device and it does have potential to be a travel studio tool. And I honestly think that some people will find creative uses for the Final Cut Camera and Final Cut Pro for iPad 2 combo, assuming that they're well integrated. The market share for traditional desktop NLEs is pretty sad at the moment, but Apple could really solidify its place as a great platform for mobile editing work. And I think it is also worth mentioning that sometimes iPads are just a good option for people who are more comfortable using interfaces more akin to mobile OSs than traditional desktops. iPhones have been around for a long while now, and for many people, they've replaced laptops and desktops, and some people have effectively only used UI based around the mobile experience. People gravitate towards systems that they know and trust. For me, that's traditional desktop environments, but that's not true of everyone. I know there are a lot of people hoping iPads will move to Mac OS, but iPads and MacBooks are separate tools for different uses, and often even different users. And another reason I waited until after WWDC to do this video is because I wanted to see what iPad OS 18 would look like. There were some cool features, mostly based around AI, Apple intelligence, but sadly there wasn't much that wound up being particularly relevant in the context of content production or post-production. I did find it odd that macOS and iOS are getting an enhanced version of screen mirroring while excluding the iPad OS. Having that feature could have made the iPad an even more versatile tool for content creation, especially if they expand or flesh out the interplay between the iPad and Mac versions of apps like Final Cut Pro. Still, Debuting the M4 on the iPad reaffirms it as a device that Apple is putting thought and resources into, much like the M1 did for the Mac Mini, and I'm curious to learn more about what that entails. But let us know your own thoughts, experiences, guesses, hopes, dreams, etc. in the comments. I'm Scott with B&H. Keep it fun out there, y'all.